Are low interest rates impacting on your investment returns? It's time to rethink. Rethink Investing creates wealth for clients through the strategic purchase of positively geared, high cash flow commercial property. Industrial properties, retail assets or office spaces can be a smart investment option that produces significant and long-term return on investment. Rethink your investment options and look to commercial property. Learn more at rethinkinvesting.com.au. Rethink Investing, Australia's number one commercial buyer's agency. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Oh, good day. How are you going? Thanks for joining us on the Smart Property Investment Show. Uh, I do enjoy this. It's a highlight of, I get to do it a couple of times every week, chat with property investors and people that work in property right across Australia. So it's a real privilege to do that. And thank you all for tuning in and listening to this. We had a, a massive January, uh, more people than ever before over the month of January tuned into the Smart Property Investment Show. So I'm hoping that was uh, people sort of relaxing over the Christmas break and the holiday period in Jan, tuning in, preparing for 2020 and how their lot in life may look when it comes to property. So uh, again, some good feedback coming through editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. Keep it coming. It's really cool. Also, all those questions coming through, we'll get them answered on air in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. And also those reviews coming through iTunes and wherever you're listening to the podcast as well. So thanks so much for doing that. Please keep them coming. The team here get a real kick out of it. So um, the things you need to know is editor at smartpropertyinvestment.com.au or send us a direct message on social as well. Keep involved. Now, a lot of the questions that we have been getting and, and some of the commentary or feedback I get around the traps when I go to property investment shows or different sessions is the whole idea of investing in property via your self-managed super fund, or I'll shorten to SMSF, which I'm sure most of you have heard of before. Now, this has been a, a great vehicle for a lot of Australians to invest in property. It doesn't necessarily work for every single person. Investing in the SMSF requires a certain sense of rigor, which for some people may be beyond their skills or capabilities around it or not necessary. So, I want to do a bit of a deep dive into SMSF today, in particular, how you can potentially invest in property via your SMSF. Now, I'm not an accountant or a financial advisor by any means. This is way outside of my pay grade. So I've got someone into the studio who knows a lot more about this than I do and more about it than most. Uh, Andrew Yee, he's a director of HLB Manjud, which is a, let's call them a mid-tier accounting firm, advisory practice who I imagine helps Australians invest in SMSF. Is that pretty much what you do, Andrew? Well, that's correct, Phil. Yes. Yeah, you got it in a nutshell. Okay. How hard is it to invest in property in a self-managed super fund and is it for everyone? It's not hard. When you have a self-managed super fund, there's a lot of rules surrounding that. A self-managed super fund is actually the vehicle, a tax vehicle, and it can invest in property and all sorts of things like shares, properties as well. So it's just a vehicle and how hard is it? It's not hard at all, but there's a lot of rules involved. So if you stick to the rules, it's not hard at all. So the rules that I've looked at, I've set up in a self-managed super fund with the purpose of investing in property about two to three years ago, and Mm -hmm. I've set up the bank accounts associated with it, but I have done absolutely nothing with it because I've just sat there and gone, oh, I just don't really have the time to worry about doing it. I've got a a pretty good advisor, and I'm actually meeting him this afternoon Mm -hmm. to chat about that amongst other things. But um, is it... For everyone to invest in property in a self-managed super fund? Well, the people that invest in self-managed super funds or use a self-managed super fund, they need to have motivation and they need to decide that they want control over their retirement investments and they need to have that control and flexibility and if they what decides to invest in property, they need to have that motivation and all the, the rules and compliance that you have with the self-managed student fund, they need to prepare to be buy into that. So it's not for everyone. So if you're setting up a self-managed fund and you just leave it there and don't worry about it and just have it in cash, then you're not doing yourself any favours. Mm. They're not the people that should have a self-managed student fund. And it also doesn't depend on how many assets you have or how wealthy you are. You really have that motivation that you really want to do it yourself and control your retirement by having that vehicle that we you have in control and be it you know investing in property or shares or private equity it really depends on the person so if you motivate it to do it then yeah, self managed some food funds for you and i remember doing some work on this a little while ago just in terms of the size of the smsf 
sector, and a lot of our listeners might not know just how significant it is right now. There's probably, what, 500,000 SMSF or funds now plus created in Australia, over a million trustees associated with an SMSF. It's the biggest asset class in terms of superannuation, It's in terms of the value of it's bigger than retail funds now and industry funds. That's correct, isn't it, Andrew? I haven't looked at the latest stats, but what you're saying is probably correct. It's pretty much the biggest superannuation vehicle, even bigger than the retail funds or the industry funds. So there's a lot of money going into self-money super funds. Mm. So it's obviously still popular. So the growth of the amount of funds and the size of the funds is not really tapering off over time. Even though when you look at securing borrowing or mortgage finance through your SMS, has got a lot harder, but we'll touch on that in a moment. Yeah. So when you were working with your clients mm. and there might be a recommendation to potentially use an SMSF as a vehicle for wealth creation versus investing outside of your SMSF, when is it about right for someone to start considering setting up an SMSF in terms of the balance of their superannuation or their how old they are or where they are on sort of a retirement planning journey? Well, there's no set parameters, but normally as a matter of course is people start thinking about their retirement and doing more with it when they're paid off their mortgage and paid off the school fees and they're in the latter stages of their working lives and they start to save for the retirement. So that's normally what happens. And in terms of the amount you need, there's no set amount as long as you're prepared to put more, you know, build it up over time. Of course, you're restricted by the amount you can put into self-made super or superannuation in general by contribution caps and restrictions. But... Uh, there's no set limit, but that regulator ASIC had a figure of 200000 some time ago. Mm. So they say that as a figure. But for our clients, we tend to see clients with maybe 300 to half a million dollars in superannuation, and then they start thinking about self-managed super fund. But if the client is motivated to have the self-managed super fund, then there is no set limit. Mm. So, yeah. And- you know, when you start, you sort of this, and it's the number that's bandied around is this two hundred thousand dollars. Otherwise, mm-hmm. it doesn't make doesn't make financial sense in mm-hmm. terms of the audit costs and other yeah. associated costs to invest via a self managed super fund under two hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars. So it's a bit rubbery that yeah, number, yeah. but it's it's sort of a you know a watermark for when you start considering it. Correct. But just because you've got two hundred thousand dollars in super doesn't necessarily mean you should choose to start investing in a self-managed super fund. What are normally the triggers for people and the clients that you work with where they go, I actually want to be a little bit more self-directed in my investing Mm. rather than just having a a retail or an industry fund? Well, you have investors who see the performance of their retail or industry fund they think they can do it better themselves and they're quite in tune with their financial affairs and investments, so forth. And then they, for example, they might, invest in shares or property outside of superannuation. And so they think, well, I think I can do it myself. So I'll self manage super fund and I apply the same personal investment principles within the fund as I do outside the fund. So it goes back to the, the person, the individual, and what they want to do for their personal investments. And when we come back from break, we'll have a chat about when you should be considering property in your self-managed super fund over other asset classes and also borrowing. Back in a moment. If you're a regular listener to the Smart Property Investment Show, then odds are you're already a property fanatic who loves hearing stories on investing from real people, the good, the bad and the ugly. Be with people just like you and join the group Passionate Property Investors on Facebook now. Become part of a community who know what to do and when to do it. And the time to do it is now. Passionate Property Investors. Tribe, tools and tips. Find us on Facebook today. Welcome back, everyone. Here with Andrew Yee, Director, HLB Man Judd. We're chatting self-managed super funds and, in particular, investing in property via it. Andrew, what are the benefits of investing in property via a self-managed super fund? Well, the benefits is the self-managed super fund is a very attractive vehicle because of the tax concession. So you're only paying 15% in the accumulation phase, meaning you're still contributing to the fund. And if you commence a pension in the fund, the tax rate could potentially go down to zero. And the other thing is if you sell the property, you derive a profit, the capital gains is discounted 
So you're paying a 50 grade of, if you held the asset for more than 12 months and you realise that after that, then you're paying a 50 capital gain tax rate of 10%. So that's probably the most attractive feature of having your self-managed super fund and then having a property in there is the tax benefits. But then again, if you're getting those tax benefits, the government has fairly strict rules if you're having a self-managed super fund. So that's the other side of the uh, equation. Mm. Yeah. And what else would be the negatives of having property in your self-managed super fund? Because I know there's a lot of rules, and again, or there's a lot of rules when it comes to SMSF, and there's certain rules around adding value mm. to a property within a self-managed super fund. It's very difficult to manufacture equity like that, isn't that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the disadvantages, and they probably are more magnified recently with with new super rules, is that you can only get so much capital into your super fund these days because the the government is paying, well, if you've got up to $1.6 million, you, you can't make any further non consistent contributions. So we're probably we being a big lumpy asset, it's difficult to get, you know, huge chunks of that sort of an asset into your fund. So the biggest disadvantage I see is liquidity and actually getting your asset into the fund. And if for example when you retire and you decide to pay a pension, the other issue is how do you make the minimum pension requirements? For example, if you're Minimum pension per year is four percent of the fund balance, but your rental return is less than four percent. You've got an issue straight away. How do you how do you pay your pension? So the biggest issues I see that you know getting the property into the fund and then you've got liquidity issues. Mm. For example, when you're paying pension or paying expenses. What's the succession planning like for people investing in in a self managed super fund? Should there be you know, the big things in property, death, divorce, or, you know, debt or whatever. Yeah. Talking about liquidity, it's a lot mm. difficult to transfer assets within your self-managed super fund unless you're transferring the whole self-managed super fund. That's right. That's mm. right. Well, what happens on succession if you've got an asset, big lumpy asset into the fund? Well, how do you how do you transfer it? Well, new members can inherit the asset if they become members of the fund after the deceased's death. But then it doesn't mean that they get the asset. Typically, the asset still has to come out of the fund mm. as a death benefit, and then it goes to the beneficiaries, who quite often would be the children. And if they become members of the fund, they have to contribute the asset back into the fund. Well, then that's an issue because how do you get that big lumpy asset back into the fund when you've got quite restrictive contribution caps? Mm. Yeah, and there was let's call it sort of five, six plus years ago, there was a huge spate of people setting up self-managed super funds for the purpose of investing in property and mm. subsequent to that, the government sort of clamped down quite a lot on property within self-managed super funds and the perception was that a lot of people were buying assets within a self-managed super fund which were, let's say, promoted by less than scrupulous property marketers mm. and other associated people, you know, out there capitalising on, you know, this sort of wholesale shift towards doing this and that now it's largely gone and there's a lot of legislation in place around it. Can you give us a bit of sense of all that? Well, I think, yeah, as you said, five or six years ago, there was a big run on on promoters using the self-managed super fund as a promotional marketing tool to get people to use their superannuation as a deposit or down payment on a property within the self-managed super fund. And that became a big marketing tool for them and a lot of people just got into trouble. They rolled over their small super balance into a self-managed super fund, and a lot of them didn't receive any proper financial advice. So they were just creating all these vehicles, self-managed super funds, putting properties into the into the fund. Um, quite often, using borrowing, using leverage, and finding you know with properties that they were buying. They weren't able to make repayments because the rental return just wasn't able to meet repayments. And then the actual investors couldn't put any further money into the fund. They didn't have many um, other assets to contribute to the fund. So were huge problems and it just got all blown out of control. And then this, you know, the regular stepped in and tried to corral these promoters and to try to stop it. I don't know if it's stopped 100 percent that definitely it's not as out there as, as it was before no, it's definitely not as prevalent yeah. and there's some pretty big scalps by memory that went yeah. down with it I can't, yeah. I can't remember 
the company's name, but mm. I think the director went to jail around it. You know, it was yeah. big fallouts, yeah, you know, yeah. big, big promoters around mm. this and, and putting Australians unnecessarily into self-managed super funds for their benefit rather than correct. for the benefit of the client. Correct, and, correct. and, you know, that said, as we touched on it, you know, self-managed super fund doesn't work for all. No, you know, no. You, know, you need to you, – you need good, sound, solid advice around um, whether or not it works for you, but also – just understanding of the requirements and compliance requirements around it, which can be a headache. That's right. There's, there's a lot of requirements. I think if we go back to self-managed super fund, it's probably more suited to the sophisticated investor, not mm. the normal, I guess, how I say, suburban mum and dads who who are looking at property outside of superannuation. So if you marry that into a self-managed super fund, look, quite often – these people can't deal with all the rules and regulations and, and what are the compliance requirements to go along with that. So that really just turns them off. But, you know, by that time it can be too late mm. if they've got the property in there. Yeah. It's hard to unravel, hard to unpack. Yeah. And to your point, you know, for your inverted commas, classic Australian suburban mum and dad, <sighs> they were in many ways the target for a lot of these unscrupulous mm. marketeers around mm. self-managed super funds and hence the reason why we've had government intervention. But when you look at self-managed super fund, the clue about the nature of the investment is it is self-managed. So unless you've got financial acumen or you actually mm. understand, appreciate or have a background in investing, it can be challenging doing it yourself. Now, we're fortunate there is a lot of good advisors that specifically concentrate on helping people invest more effectively within a self-managed super fund. But you need to pay for that advice. That advice is not free. And if you are getting free advice, I'd probably question whether or not it's the right advice, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And yeah, you need advice, definitely. There's not many people that specialise enough or have the acumen or the education to run their own fund without having some advice along the way, be it coaching by their accountant or their financial planner or their wealth advisor or their lawyer. So you really need to have advice and obviously you pay for it and quite often it's not cheap. So, it's not cheap, but if you've got a significant Asset base, yeah. two hundred thousand dollars plus is a lot of money, and for a lot yeah. of people, that is their retirement. Yeah. Um, when you start, then you get three, four, five hundred thousand mm. bucks. You know, you've got to be getting these investment decisions right. Mm. I hope you're enjoying our chat around self-managed super funds. We'll be back in a moment. Are you 100% satisfied with your current property manager? Tired of chasing them for updates? Is making more money from your property investment important to you? With your Bonzo, you get one platform, one point of contact and one low management fee. For greater ROI from your property investments, visit landlordroi.com. Welcome back to the Smart Property Investment Show here with Andrew Yee, Director, HLB, Man, Judd, now... I think we've worked out and then sort of had a good chat around whether or not SMSFs are right for everyone, Andrew, and the benefits and maybe the pitfalls of investing in property via self managed super fund. Now, for a lot of the work that you do and or maybe your client base, what sort of typical percentage do most people who have a self managed super fund typically hold some property in there, or is it normally the the exception to the rule and more people are equity investing or keeping their money in cash? In my experience, in our client base, most people with self-managed super funds do not have property. They mainly invest in cash and shares, listed shares, mm. because they find the fully frank dividends are quite helpful, handy with those big tax refunds at year end. The people that do have property in the self-managed super funds are normally those that don't like shares or don't like managed funds. So... They are property people, so they are typically property investors outside of superannuation. So they're the ones that love to have property in their self-managed super funds, but they are the exception. And you might have people who have their own business, so quite often they have their business property in their self-managed super funds, so the business is paying rent to the self-managed super fund for the lease of property. So that's the two type of property investment people that have self-managed super funds. But the ones that do have property in their funds, they do quite well out of it, mm. definitely. And I know of people, and hopefully it'll be me one day when I finally get mine in the year, but who have had very favourable returns mm. having property inside the self-managed super fund. And, and I would say they're probably more of a sophisticated investor rather than someone who is not. When you sort of meet with a client the first time and you have a discussion, I imagine it's more of a holistic wealth conversation, yeah. but when you start talking about self-managed super funds, is your preference – in cash or listed shares before property? Or do you normally put property first and think, well, have you considered this particular opportunity? 
Well, I don't normally advise on the investments. Normally the clients come to me and say, I want to set up a self-managed super fund. I've got X number of dollars outside of super. I've got X number of dollars in the industry fund or retail fund. I want to become self-directed now with my superannuation. So, and then say, okay, well, we can set up a self-managed super fund. So they need to tell me, oh, I want to set up a self-managed super fund and I want to buy shares or I want to buy a property. They've already got the asset in mind on what they want to invest in self managed super funds and we just put together the structure for them and manage the compliance. So we don't say, well, you shouldn't have property or you shouldn't have shares unless we actually see that it's not going to work out because there may be huge liquidity issues involved in having a property or so forth in terms of the strategy. And do you have a uh, challenge uh, in a favourable way investors who come in on the basis of wanting to set up an SMSF to particularly invest property and to sort of say, hey, have you actually thought about not investing in property in your sub super fund and considering other asset classes like listed shares or cash or fine wine or art, right? Some people <laughs> invest in some pretty crazy stuff in yeah. their self-managed super fund and some of it works well. Yeah. How do you challenge those sort of initial perceptions or assumptions that people might have about they have to invest in property, think about other things? Well, you need to... Yeah, you know, I guess gauge with the actual individual and see their expertise in property and quite often you know they're, they're good at investing property and there's no point in trying to discourage them or you should be being shares, you should be in cash because the whole point of you seeing me is that you want to set up a self-managed super fund and you want to put property in there mm. because you know how to invest in property, you know how to derive the best returns for your retirement, be it property or be in shares. So, you know, the discussion doesn't have to be an argument of, no, you shouldn't have this domestic or you shouldn't be doing this. But if the person's qualified to do it, then we let them go for it. Mm. Yeah. And again, the clues in the name, right? self manage You've got yeah. to make your own decisions when it comes to That's right. self management And you mentioned compliance beforehand and you know, setting up the structure, but then the ongoing compliance mm. requirements of a self-managed super fund. Can you give us some sense about what sort of compliance tasks there are associated with running a property through an SMSF and just how how much of a time and potential cash impact that might have on investors? With the clients, obviously, you need to keep fairly good records. So if you're not into record keeping and so forth, then again, whether it's property or shares or so forth, you shouldn't be having a self-managed super fund. You need to be able to have your paperwork ready and to give your account or to, to your auditor so they can carry out the annual compliance work. So that's the key then. If you want a hassle-free option, then you don't have a self-managed super fund. You just have your own retail fund where you're getting a member staying in every year. So that puts it in perspective. Mm. So you have to be prepared to deal with that paperwork. Yeah, it is. And uh, I know a lot of property investors who struggle with the paperwork (sighs) associated with just investing outside of super. So inside of super, it becomes... Something else, and, and you don't have the flexibility if you're investing outside of super, just shifting money around in and out of bank accounts. That's right. right. Once it's in your super fund, it stays in your super yeah, fund. Yeah, you, you can't mix bank accounts. So once you do that, you've got a problem with the auditor. He may say you breach the rules and then you'll lodge a, a breach notice to the ATO. So you've got issues there. So the rig, it must be very rigorous, your record keeping, because it has to be audited. Whereas if it's outside of super, there's no need to be audited. Mm. So that's that extra layer of record keeping and rigour in your account keeping. So what's the um, penalties or how grave can penalties be if you don't conduct a compliant self-managed super fund? I imagine it ranges from a slap on the wrist to maybe jail time, right? Probably not jail time, but that can be an option. It depends how (laughs) how naughty you've been. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, to be a severe penalty is normally you really have that motivation of breaching the CIS Act and doing the wrong thing, pulling money into the fund from other sources and then ripping it out and and basically taking out of your super from a retail fund. So that happens to normally the promoters, and sometimes these promoters are the property schemes. So but in terms of penalties, normally if you've just done the wrong thing, you might just get a, a financial penalty as a trustee or you might have to go to a, a, a course on being a trustee of the self-managed super fund, so education, or worst-case scenario, the ATO could make the fund non-complying, which they could then take potentially half the assets of the fund. Okay. But that is very, very worse. That's very rare that happens. Very worse. And that's normally through just deliberate, Great. Uh, yeah. not like just some yeah. negligence. And yeah. as I said, I can't remember the numbers and yeah. I haven't looked at it for a little while, but yeah. there's more than half a million 
funds in Australia. Yeah. The last time I looked was probably a couple of years ago. But uh, as you can see, so it's got a lot harder to secure property through a self-managed super fund purely because of the financing options is now completely limited. There was a point in time, sort of five, six years ago, when mm. there was a lot of parity in interest rates if you're investing in a self-managed super fund or outside of a super fund where your interest rates were pretty consistent. And then there was a, a period of time where a couple of lenders started coming out of the markets. St. George was always a strong lender uh, through Westpac. Um, Macquarie Bank were always sort of good, solid lenders within self-managed super funds and those rates started going north and there was a huge disparity by a couple of percent sometimes plus around borrowing in a super fund and now it's there's only a handful of lenders that allow you to to invest or borrow through a super fund and, and interest rates are pretty high. What, what's been a key driver of that? I think in normal just banking policies, not just self-managed super funds, but just being able to lend money in general is really much dried up or tightened up and they've mm. been very – very strict with rules, and um, I think the banks, lenders that were there before, they're just finding lending to self-managed super funds just too hard. There's just too much paperwork. There's just too much rules to hurdles to get over. I think, and they probably see that it's not worthwhile. Maybe the profitability is not there. Mm. That's it's different. Different. The financing has definitely dried up. Other options that trustees now look at is trying to get the money via their own name and then possibly on lend it to their super fund. But then get, there are then complex rules around that. Mm. Yeah. And so, you can't see getting easier in time or do you think this is uh, just the right I see end? a trend of, you know, trying to reduce the amount of borrowing in self-made super fund to buy property mm. or borrowing in general self-made super fund. I see that as a trend. So definitely making it harder. So, you know, getting the benefits of leverage via your super fund is a lot harder mm. and it's probably going to get harder in time. So. Yeah. You should just pay cash for everything in your super fund, right? It's a good asset class if you're not borrowing within it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, as you said, when the property spruikers promoted having a, a property in your self-made super fund, they also had the uh, borrowing option as well. So that was another line of, I guess, business for them. But quite often, heavily gearing your self-made super just doesn't make financial sense because it's negative gearing outside of super, that's okay getting a tax deduction for it, but... In a self-managed super fund, tax deduction might only be worth 15% max. So does it make as much sense? Probably not. Mm. No. Lots of things to consider. Uh, and we write a lot about this on smartpropertyinvestment.com. So if you want to see, even concentrate more on this, you know, a number of years ago, five, six years ago, it was a huge uh, discussion point for us because as where a lot of people were actually investing was via the vehicle of self-managed super fund, which has now decreased uh, considerably. And uh, we might just do a wrap-up article on just how that's changed just so we can look at some of these headline uh, numbers, but uh, Andrew, I, I feel a lot more informed after chatting with you. So thanks so much for okay. coming and uh, okay. spending some time with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks, okay. uh, everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, our discussion around self-managed super funds. Remember, editor at smartproperinvestment.com to you. Get in touch with the team. If you've got any questions, we'll get them answered on air. If you want to send us a direct message, it's just uh, Smart Property HQ is the social media handle you need to go and track down on any of the different platforms. Uh, I hope you are subscribing to our daily morning newsletter. So the first to know what's happening in property, property investment right across Australia, it's smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And please, that small favour, keep those reviews coming on iTunes. We do get a kick out of them, particularly those ones with five stars. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned.